Welcome to the Airmere Roundtable. Today is the 14th of April, 2021, and I have a special guest, Wayne Klump. Uh, Wayne's been uh, running the Sleepwell portfolio for, oh, I guess, about a little over six months now with us. And uh, um, Wayne's a good friend and a good, good trader, lots of great ideas, nice articles every week. And uh, you're here to show us a little bit uh, more about some, uh, some of the stuff going on behind the scenes with the Sleepwell, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Tom. And yeah, before you know, it's before we get to too much anything, I'll go through a disclosure slide and everything. But yeah, today I definitely wanted to talk about just kind of hey, sleep well portfolio and kind of what we've updated, where we've gone through things, and I'll go through an outline and then you know just kind of improving for uh, portfolios with correlation. And uh, I've been love doing the sleep well portfolio at Aramir. And um, it's been wonderful, the outreach that we've had, and it looks like it's been helping uh, a lot of people. And so it's, it's just been wonderful. And so uh, with that, we'll get into disclosures and then we'll get into some details and we'll have some fun today. Sounds great. So first and foremost, get through our disclosure here. Uh, Aramir Corporation, myself or Sleep Well Investing is not a broker dealer or investment advisor. All webinars and seminars are for educational purposes only or entertainment. Uh, options, futures, currencies, investing, stocks, all that is uh, involves risk and might not be suitable for all investors. Please talk to your financial advisor or uh, decisions yourself. Uh, past performance is not indicative of future results. And this is for personal use only and all information is not for commercial use or for sale. All of that is needing for licensing. So with that out of the way, anything that you want to add to that, Tom, before I move on? Uh, nope. I mean, this slide pretty much covers it. If you want to read the whole thing, just go to the bottom of any of our web pages and you'll see the full thing in all its glory. Perfect. In all of its glory. Nice. All right. So just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. First, I'm just going to briefly go over you know, who I am so that way you know who's talking to you right now. You know, what is the sleep well portfolio? What was it designed for um, in general? What it's not to those types of things. And then uh, a question that has popped up and we're going to kind of dig into that is, you know, how is the sleep well portfolio so simple and so easy to, to use, but yet it has so much risk reduction. And there's a lot of complication behind the scenes, but we're going to try to take that complication and simplify it down today. And that's going to lead us into what is correlation. Uh, and then we're also going to go into an alternative correlation calculation that I look at more so than just the raw correlation. Then we're going to go into the sleep all portfolio update, which is how it's been doing, what, it, what are some of the new things that have been added just since it's been live um, and that type of process. Then we're going to also go into an example of a weekly allocation process, which is an example of just updating the portfolio on a weekly basis to show how simple we've made it and uh, how easy it is to follow along for anyone to you know, model a mirrored portfolio or tweak things themselves. And then we'll open it up for questions. So on the first topic at hand, you know, who am I? My name is Wayne Klump. I have a bachelor's degree from the University of North Texas. I studied behavior and business. And two subjects I love, I've devoted my career to, uh, business and behavior, uh, especially behavior analysis and finances actually, it shows up quite often. Um, some of the weekly articles that I've been writing or and that I will write are actually gonna start uh, rotating around some of those subjects. In general, I'm a strategy developer and a trader. I've done that for my career. I've worked with some hedge funds some other money managers, and then I would definitely work with strategy developers on portfolio construction and proprietary models. I've got this vision that we're working on, which is to make high-end portfolio management accessible and simple so that anyone can use it, anyone can understand it, and it will be beneficial to anyone that can. So we're gonna be leveraging the financial technology of the new era, which is actually something we were just talking about, Tom and I, before the recording started, is uh, that we've got lots of opportunities nowadays that we used to not have uh, with some of the financial technology that's out and the internet. So how did this all kind of start? Where did it all happen? Well, 
we all live and we all learn. And when I first started out uh, coming out of college, I had gone to DIY investing seminars. I had, you know, was learning how to trade. I talked to other uh, traders. I also talked to other investors that were a little bit older. Luckily, I had some in the family. And um, there was this common thread pretty much that I found at you know, a lot of DIY investing seminars. And there was this constant struggle or there's this strategy hopping or, you know, there was some of these other uh, conditions where there were, there were people that were trading with very small amounts of their money, you know, maybe, you know, 5% of their total portfolio and the rest was just piled in cash. Um, and there was just so, so much, everyone was, everyone was working to make a life better and change, you know, maybe their retirement date or their finances. And um, what ended up, what ended up coming out to is that I, I had saw that, you know, there was just this, this want to reduce risk in the markets and still grow an account. And I was thinking that with the skills that I had learned and working with wealthy clients and working with other money managers, I go, you know, we can, we can do something and we can make this to where almost anyone can take care of this. And that way uh, we can hopefully el eliminate some of the pain and struggle of, of growing an account in the markets in a steady way and eliminate some of the fear and uh, allow people to sleep a little bit better at night. And so what came out was the sleep well portfolio. And there's a few criteria that I wanted and that the sleep well portfolio takes care of. So the first one is, is that it had to be simple. So we only use ETFs. There's no options in it. There's no craziness to it. It's simple. It's only ETFs. It's also long only. So there's no shorting. There's no inverse ETFs that are going on. There's no crazy market timing strategy. So everything is um, all up and up. Then it's also, I wanted it to be self-adapting and self-adapting specifically to the macroeconomic pressures of the world. Uh, as, I as I've worked with wealthy clients, I've realized that there are, there are massive differences in economic cycles or business cycles, and to be dynamic and, and, and malleable in those environments is really, really crucial to be able to retain consistent returns. Just like a business, a business has to adapt when the market changes for their, just their, uh, their customers, right? Um, and as an investor, we have to change as our market changes, which is the economy and investing and currencies and those types of things. So it needed to be dynamic and ever-changing. It also had to be able to provide reliably consistent returns, right? We didn't want to be able to, or we didn't want to have time periods where we have, you know, massive bear market drawdowns and for many, many years, not being able to hit high waters again, right? We want to be able to just consistently produce good returns every year with, nor, uh, with uh, very stable risks. Then the lastly, we wanted it to be extremely scalable. So something to compete or not necessarily to compete, but to uh, be able to be an alternative to say something like a 60-40 portfolio or something like that. 60-40 um, portfolio is great. It was made quite a while ago, <laughs> back a, quite a few generations ago was when the 60-40 portfolio was made. And one of the, some of the newer portfolios is like risk parities and things like that. And the sleep well portfolio is really meant to be the, the most modern take on these types of portfolios with the ability that we have now, you know, back in the day, we used to only be able to invest in generally stocks and bonds. Nowadays we can do Forex. Nowadays we can do precious metals really easy, those types of things, emerging markets. And so we're going to be able to use those and we're going to be able to be, uh, to be able to scale them really well. Now that we kind of have an understanding of what the sleep well portfolio is and what its desire was, sometimes what helps, especially like helps me is to kind of understand what it's not. So going through what the sleep well portfolio is not, it's not a 200% up return per year. It's not going to 
change someone's life overnight or anything like that, it can definitely do that in the long term because of sound investing principles and uh, some leveraging. And we'll get into some of that kind of things later. And it can do those types of things, but it's definitely not going to be your I'm day trading and I'm swing trading this and I'm by the computer, you know, 18 hours a day um, and I'm studying hardcore or something like that. This is not that. This is meant to be, hey, I'm going to check it once a week. It's five minutes, knock it out, move on, go live my life and do some other cool things, right? And uh, find my purpose type of thing. Not an overnight get rich. We kind of already discussed this, but it's not a, hey, I'm going to call this super long or... I'm going to leverage up with options or I'm trying to go, I'm going to short squeeze GameStop or something like that. It is not like that. It's not a weekly trade. Although we check it weekly, it's not meant to be, hey, I'm going to trade this week and this is a whole different setup this week. It's really meant to be a rolling long-term investing strategy, like I said, to be more as an alternative to a 60-40 or risk parity or even just someone that just pure indexes. If someone's wanting to take the crazy amounts of risks that pure indexing comes out with, that's a different story, but it's not a weekly trade. It's definitely not a market timing strategy. We'll get into that. It has somewhat seen some sort of market timing, uh, but it's not necessarily meant to be like that. It's not going to say, hey, we're going into a bear market and this is it, or hey, we're going up or this is it. It's not meant to call tops and bottoms of specific markets. And it's not meant to call tops and bottoms of each individual asset that we move either. And then lastly, it's not stake oil. It's real. I invest in it. We have uh, current subscribers that use it and it performs as it should. It performs regularly uh, and it's done it year over year. And so that's what's really nice about it. It's not a fake thing. It's not um, something that's hoopla. There are real investors in this. So the Fleet Ball Portfolio as a service, we started out in September last year to make it live to where the public can use it. Before that, I was just primarily using it in private ways with a very, uh, with uh, private clients and myself. And what that ended up doing is, is once we opened it live to people, it's been growing nice and steadily since. And because it's been growing steadily since, and we've had um, more people find the sleep well portfolio, find uses for the sleep well portfolio and doing good things with it, we can kind of see how people have used the sleep well portfolio. And not all of them were exactly the way that uh, I, I initially intended, which is actually a really beautiful thing because some people have found a really strong ways that it works for them. Um, and so that's kind of what we're going to roll through. So the first part is kind of mirroring the portfolio. And really that's about an alternative to a 60-40 or risk parity or just a pure indexing. And a lot of people have actually uh, used this portfolio to match it and just invest alongside it. And it's done really well over the other alternatives. So right here in red, uh, we've got our risk parity, which has definitely had some struggles since September. That's more so due to bonds. Uh, we've, in, in the beginning, uh, when we first were coming out with the sleep well portfolio live, it, it, was a com it, was, it was a conversation that we had and the sleep well portfolio didn't have any investments and bonds. Uh, it was just one of those things that the macro environment was not going to be conducive to bonds for a while. Then the 60-40 portfolio is kind of the same thing right here in blue. It's just had a drag with bonds, right? And then uh, S&P, which is now just starting to kind of take up and tail up right here, has actually just been having its own normal drag. And that's just because of Yet again, the macro environment not being 100% conducive to large caps, although it's starting to turn around right now. And so we'll see how that ends up all playing out. That's the first way that people have been using it. Another way is just a cash alternative. So uh, another one of those reasons that I started the sleep well portfolio, which was that I saw so many DIY like traders or DIY investors or 
they were sitting on just piles of cash. And I realized that sometimes I was the same way. I had had a bunch of cash in my portfolio and I wanted to do something with it. And I, I love the fact that people have actually done something with their cash instead of letting it sit and basically sit in a, in a digital mattress and just lose its 2% per year or faster sometimes. Uh, I mean, right now, inflation, I think, is a little bit over 2%. And that's uh, unfortunate. And then not only is it losing that percentage, but it's also missing out on all the opportunity gain to even just investing in, in pure indexing and definitely missing out on the potentiality of something like a sleep well portfolio. They've also used it as a diversified strategy, one that they rebalance off of and are creating something different. You know, so maybe they're swing trading or maybe they're short trading or something like that. And it's it had the portfolio itself has worked out really well to just rebalance off of. And uh, they've looked at, you know, historical returns and have seen, okay, how is this going to match up, which will lead us into a little bit of like correlation and type of things like that. So the other part of this is content, really. And the sleep well portfolio comes with uh, just its own historical thing. And then, of course, we've got uh, how allocations move. And this might look like a, like a watercolor graph or something right here, which it very much does. It's actually pretty, um, talk about financial art, right? Uh, but each one of these colors in the background here, uh, you know, one is uh, dark blue is SPY, TLT, gold. And this is kind of just a, a brief look at how the assets move in the sleep well portfolio at different times. And it's not meant to be a market timing strategy, but you can definitely see that, or that it's definitely been seen that prior to large corrections, so something like, uh, something like the debt crisis right here back in 2011, you can see that we are already phasing out of stocks. We are phasing into gold. You're phasing into bonds and stuff like that prior to the large correction at all, right? And that's because there was macro pressures that were pushing us into those assets and away from stocks. And there have been some subscribers that are using that to kind of front run uh, some, some strategies that they're using or ways that they invest um, that are maybe long or short. And it's just adding it to their quiver of another type of indicator that's vastly different than the typical, you know, volume, price, and volatility uh, indicators that are out there or some derivative of. And then lastly, they're using it for just information and education. I write a weekly article every week, and that has a topic of interest. It also has kind of just what, it, you know, what are the risks changing in each of the assets and then just kind of wrap ups and uh, general comments on the, the portfolio and fundamental drivers of why the portfolio is in a specific allocation setup. So this painting can get really like, or not this painting, but this chart is really complicated or it looks complicated. There's a lot of moving parts back here. And the portfolio itself is designed and it has its complexities. In the name of Albert Einstein, though, we're going to make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. So the whole goal behind the sleep well portfolio was to have these macro pressures and assets moving and uh, business cycles and economics and all of these things. There's all these variables that are interweaving and playing onto each other, but we wanted to neck it down into something that was reasonable and simple as an end product, right? So how is the sleep well portfolio so inclusive with so little? Well, for those that, that aren't familiar with the sleep well portfolio at all, we use six assets. One is the SPY, TLT, gold, UP, and none of these are suggestions or anything like that. So I'm just sitting here talking about what we use. And large caps, bonds, precious metals, or CPI inflation, uh, this is you know, US dollar, things like that. So we have some Forex. So all of these play off of each other in the four primary business cycles. 
So you have an expansionary cycle, you have this kind of peak zone right here, and then you've got this recessionary cycle, which is normally what everyone is worried about, um, even through the expansionary cycle and even in the peaks, this recession is really kind of where the fear comes from. And then this cross section is when there's, you know, the people have always talked about there's blood on the streets, you know, things like that. And each one of these assets, each one up here acts very different in each cycle. And there's a reason, and that's the reason that we have them in the portfolio. And you can kind of see this in, as soon as I finish racing here, and you can definitely see this in that graph that we showed on the previous page, which is when we've got a recessionary time period right here, we, the, the sleep well portfolio isn't very heavily invested in stocks at all because that's not conducive to that specific economic cycle. It's more conducive to have uh, US dollars or things like that that are more deflationary during um, some of the heavy cycles and contractions. But then at the same time, when you have large expansionary cycles, right, we'll have heavy allocations. You know, we've got lots of, uh, lots of large caps in here. We've got lots of small caps in here. And you can kind of see that with the colors back there. All right, so these four cycles, everything, it's still complicated, right? So, you know, and, and, and I could put together a portfolio that has, you know, 150 assets in it. And say, oh, yeah, it's amazing, right? You know, so, and I love this quote, and I actually do come back to this quite often because I try to catch myself before I'm making something a little bit too complex. But, you know, any intelligent fool can make something bigger and more complex. And it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. So, it, it feels good to have, oh yeah, I've got this super complicated algorithm or portfolio or complex things. And this, this, is, this thing's gonna be amazing, right? And it kind of feels good that something's gotta be really complicated to work well. Well, the sleep well portfolio is meant to be simple. And how did it become so simple? Well, we're gonna look at how uh, something like correlation, we can use this, this simple calculation right? We can use to see, is making something more complicated actually going to net out some sort of benefit? And for, you, for those of you that don't know what correlation is, just a quick definition, is it's the measure of how investments move relative to one another, right? So if you've got stocks and bonds, this is the pretty much the atypical example of two assets, and this is our 60-40 our portfolio or 50-50s or um, those types of things. It's a really, really known example. And it's how these two assets move in relation to each other. They don't quite move in the same direction all the time. So what does that look like? Well, there's, there's a calculation called the correlation coefficient. And it might sound crazy, you know, coefficients, what is that, you know? but it, we're gonna break it down into something really simple here. So let's say that we've got two assets and one goes up in a straight line and the other one goes up in a straight line directly with it. Well, that's gonna equal a one on a correlation calculation or correlation coefficient. And that just means that these two assets are like identical in every way. They're identical twins. They have the same fingerprint. They do exactly the same thing every time, right? Then we've got the other side of the coin, which is this one while I'm at it too. And we're going to switch over to a different ink color too. We're gonna to use black, favorite color of Batman. All right, and say we have an asset that goes directly in the opposite direction. Then we're gonna get a correlation coefficient equal to negative one. And that just means that this asset goes in completely the opposite direction, right? So we've got from one to negative one. Well, what does zero look like? All right, great. Zero is a very interesting graph. It can't just be put out there in straight lines like that, but basically I'm gonna do my best here. Basically they have no relation to each other. So this is an equity curve, just I'm just squiggling on here, but this is an equity curve of some asset doesn't matter what it is or some trading system or anything that is, is wanting to be invested in. And 
we'll change back over to red. And then we've got a second asset that sometimes moves in the same direction and then definitely doesn't and then moves around and just doesn't have any relation to the other. And that is gonna equal us out to a zero correlation coefficient. So with that in mind, we can actually start digging into, well, what's a good correlation coefficient? Is it bad? Is it worthwhile? And really, what is the purpose of correlation coefficients, right? Well, first of all, it's risk reduction. This is normally considered the holy grail of an easy portfolio or simplifying portfolios or anything like that. So really quickly here, I'm just going to kind of describe what this graph is even over here because it's like, okay, a bunch of color lines, pretty, whatever. Um, so down here at the bottom, we've got the number of assets. So one asset, two asset, three asset, four, five, and so on and so on, right? And you can see here that as we add more assets to each other, that our risk reduces down here. And what our risk is, is we're going to look at the probability of losing money on a given year, or we can also look at on the y-axis over here to the left here, we've got our standard deviation, which might be a big word and everything like that, but we're going to simplify that. Basically what that is, is, is how many squiggles does the asset have? This is, let's call this a high standard deviation up here at 10, and a low standard deviation down here at the bottom would be something like a very smooth line. It doesn't vary at all as it moves through. And this is considered risk, or these are those drawdowns. And these large spikes that are in this, uh, this top portfolio, those are those drawdowns. Those are the ones that suck. Those are the ones that you know we feel that are gut-wrenching when we're just like, oh, I'm down money. Uh. Uh, so in essence, we can take this as, hey, hey, if we can smoothen out those variances, we can achieve uh, more risk reduction, right? And with that, we can be a little bit more efficient in our capital. If we can uh, reduce our risks, we can maybe leverage up, we can be a little bit more efficient, we can um, allocate more to a specific strategy, those types of things, right? And so as we can see here, and I'll switch my pen color again, why not? As we can see here that we get this kind of uh, diminishing returns, especially on a 60% uh, correlation right here, which is our red one, we can get a significantly diminished returns somewhere around two to three assets, where after that, it really doesn't matter how many assets we add, it's really not gonna be reducing any more risk. And that changes as we get down here. You can see that when we get down to a 10% correlation or so, our diminishing returns is somewhere around six. What's beautiful about that is that means that as we get more uncorrelated, we can add more assets and significantly reduce the risk as we move down this chart. And we get less variance and less uh, probability of losing money in a given year. And then to make it all even better is not just adding assets, but actually adding some fundamental drivers and adaptability and dynamics and uh, macro measures and things like that. We can even take a six asset portfolio and reduce the risk even further. Something like a zero correlation type of uh, system with nine assets in without actually having to do all of that. Also, what the, per, uh, what the purpose of using correlation coefficient is consistency of returns. As we can figure out what our correlation coefficients are to each other, we can make sure that because we have different assets moving at different times and making money at different times and losing money at different times, we can create consistent returns year to year instead of the gyrations of a single asset type of, uh, type of portfolio, or maybe just only a few assets type of portfolio. And then lastly, we've got asset choice. We can use correlation to choose whether we even want to have an asset in a portfolio at all. Is it, is it even worthwhile? And by doing that, we can start making a really efficient portfolio.
And on that note, this is where we're going to get into an example. And I'm going to keep all the math really simple. Um, these things can be done in Excel or um, lots of different ways. So it's all really simple. I'm not going to get into huge formulas or anything like that. So we're going to choose two assets. And I'm just looking at a data set from 2006 to current. And what our, what our portfolio is, is IWM. We're basing everything off of IWM, which, like I said, this is not a suggestion or anything like that. But because we're having uh, small caps, and let's just say that that's the base of our portfolio. So we're just a single asset portfolio. I just invest long in small caps all the time. And say I want to reduce my risk. Say I want to become more efficient. All those things that I said on the prior, on the prior slide. Well, if we calculate our correlation coefficients, we can do this a few different ways. We can do daily, we can do weekly, monthly, and then finally we can do quarterly. And the reason why I even bring up these timetables or these time uh, sets of correlations is we can see really quickly here that our correlation changes pretty dramatically actually from our daily correlation to our quarterly correlation. And why is that important? Well, the importance is definitely because it depends on when we're going to be rebalancing these two assets together. If we're rebalancing them on a daily correlation, then we definitely want to be, look, or on a daily basis, we want to be definitely looking at a daily correlation to them. If we're doing it on a quarterly basis, that's the correlation we want to look at. Do they, do they trend together per quarter? Not do they just move in opposition on a daily basis. It matters more so of do they go in the same direction over a decent trend that we're going to rebalance and, and uh, in. Now, I chose another asset to compare to, which is ELT, which is long-term treasuries or bonds. And the reason why I use this is because down here, we can see that we have almost, I mean, almost identical correlations. So on the surface here, by the last slide and by looking at well, you know, at a 0.6 correlation, you know, there's diminishing returns and maybe I don't want to have that in, things like that. On the surface, these two assets would be like, okay, well, they're not that great, right? And that's when we're going to kind of dig into a little bit of a, of a different core of a, of a different calculation to be a little bit more meaningful to what we're attempting to do here, which is simplify, simplify a portfolio and reduce the risk of a portfolio. And it's more specific to the risk that we're looking at. We're trying to add an asset to reduce the risk of the portfolio. So let's separate out the risk correlation and the return correlation. So now we've separated this out and we've got the quarterly back here, which is still the same calculation. 0.63 and 0.67. And now we've just separated out the upside and the downside correlation. And now by separating these two out, by only drawing or by only running the calculation of correlation when the asset is moving in the downward direction, we can actually paint a very drastically different picture of these two assets. 0.77, I mean, we're almost at an 80% correlation on commodities to small caps. That's basically telling us that when this asset is going down, small caps are going down 80% of the time at the same amplification of it at the same time. So by that determination, we didn't even get a 0.8. Here, let me go back. We didn't even get a 0.8% correlation on this graph at all. I mean, that's a very, very, very rough, rough correlation coefficient on the risk side, right? And then now you can also see down here that bonds have a 0.19, so a 20% correlation, which means that when this thing's going down, 
it might not be going down at the same time. We might take a little bit, you know, but it's most of the time going in a different direction at a different time. And that's what we care about most. Just that simple calculation can determine, hey, do I want this asset in my portfolio? Do I want this asset in the strategy? Do I want, maybe, maybe you're not even looking at two assets in a portfolio. Maybe you're just looking at, hey, I'm trading this strategy and I'm also trading this strategy. Do they go together or are they basically the same strategy, right? Am I just wasting effort and running two trading strategies that are almost identical to each other? And that's how we can determine by looking at when they take losses together and running a correlation coefficient calculation on it. Like I said, that's in Excel. Uh, I'm not going to get into the formulas or anything like that, um, but it's, it's very easy to look up what the correlation coefficient calculation is and, and run it. So we've got this number. Great. I'm kind of a visual person. I want to know, does, what does it look like graphically, right? You know, now this number tells us a lot. Can we see this in how an asset moves in relation to one another? So here's that first example that we were talking about, which is commodities versus large caps. And let's see if that 0.77 or you know almost 80% downside correlation is is true. Is it is it true that they're that they're losing together a lot of the time? Let's see our first example back here. Definitely. They're all losing together. This asset's going down, this asset's going down. Yet again, we have another moment where both assets are going down together. Here, we've got another time period where both assets are going down together. I mean, this picture is just, I mean, I, I, I can point so many times where this asset's going down, this asset's going down, this asset's going, I mean, it's just over and over. Look at even here in COVID, right? Small caps are going down, so is commodities. There's a fundamental relationship and there's a reason that this is happening, which I'm not going to dig into today, but just by running a simple downside correlation coefficient, we can see that these two assets behave very much like each other. And the reason why I've had a lot of people ask me about this particular asset with the sleep well portfolio is it's like, Hey man, you're not running commodities in this portfolio. Why not? Inflation's going through the roof. And, you know, commodities are going straight up. Absolutely, that is totally right. Um, but by looking at what's in the portfolio, we can also see, and here I'll switch back over to the favorite color of Batman. All right, or the favorite color of Batman, which is black. And you can see here that when small caps are significantly outperforming, we have the same tailwind in commodities. Here's a large outperformance back here in commodities. Check it out. The same thing in small caps. Now, what's nice about this is when commodities are failing, we still have businesses and the other aspects of small caps that are doing its job. So we don't always have to have the downside that happens with commodities, but we're getting almost all of the upside that happens. Here's another rise in commodities. Here's another overall uptrend in small caps. That's what this correlation is. Not only is it 0.67% correlated in general, but then its losses are almost 80% correlated. Now let's take a look at the other example, which is bonds. We said that the downside correlation of bonds was around 20%, which is significantly less than the commodities. Is that the case? Here is a losing time period in small caps, a rising time period in bonds. Losing in bonds, rising in small caps. And you can see this over and over, opposite directions, over and over, right? Now, because these two assets in general rise, they'll have some sort of positive correlation just because they're both going up long-term. When two assets go up long-term, you're normally going to get some sort of positive correlation. It's very, very, very rare to get a 0% correlation on two assets that are rising over time. And we've had a long-term bull market in bonds that have helped this. But the fundamental losses that happen in bonds right, 
are not the same as what happens in stocks. And that's because of a fundamental relationship as well. And you can see this even before um, COVID here, we had a large rise in bonds while we are having a really, really rough time in small caps. And then here we go, uh, which was the macro environment that was actually gonna happen, which is uh, bonds were uh, poised to start going down. And then we've had small caps with our inflation and everything that's been pushing it up. Everything acting hunky-dory, just like they should. So choosing assets based on just this simple correlation, this downside correlation, can really help a portfolio. And what does it actually look like when you combine them? So we kind of looked at it on a chart. Now let's look at it when we combine them. So I grab these and I combine them based on their correlation coefficients. Now we can get into some of the you know, crazy calculations, which is you know, volatility, uh, balancing and you know other calculations, but all I did here was I position sized them based on their correlation coefficients, their uh, specifically their downside correlation coefficients. And the first portfolio up here, number one is IWM. The second portfolio is the commodities and IWM, and then our third portfolio here is long-term treasuries and small caps. And you can see here out of just graphically looking at this, you're like, hey, which one do I want, right? You know, they're all rising a little bit to the right, but we can see here that when we added commodities, which is red, right? We did almost no risk reduction back here. No risk reduction in COVID, no risk reduction in 2018, no risk reduction in 2015. In fact, we probably made it even worse. Every time that these two are falling together, there's just no real risk reduction. And that goes back to the same calculation that we were running. Then we can see that bonds here, when we added bonds with their correlation coefficient, almost on every metric, so max drawdown, we reduced it. Now, Stan, I, I, I totally understand. That's a 30% drawdown. That's, you know, we're not talking about that, right? Um, but we're just talking about just general risk reductions. We can make a portfolio a lot better than a 30% uh, max drawdown. And then, you know, but we did, we improved our sharp ratio, 0.53. We, we improved our Sortino ratio. All things are on the up and up. And you can see that graphically by just how smooth this yellow line is. It very little wavers and it mostly goes up. Yes, at the end here, we can tell that bonds have definitely been dragging on the portfolio. That's a fundamental reason. That's why we have an adaptive portfolio. That's not just static, right? Static allocations are exactly what they are. They're static. That's why we get uh, some 30% risks and things like that in different macro environments. You really do want to have something that's self-adapting. That's what the sleep bulb portfolio does. It adapts to different macroeconomic environments and it's shifting between these assets and not just stocks and bonds, but other assets to make sure that we're set up right for the macro environment that's the highest probability. And that get, that creates a nice, smooth, consistent return year over year that really helps us sleep a little bit better at night. And live, since we've been here and, and it's been publicly available to watch it and watch it grow, it's been doing exactly what it always has been doing and uh, what, I, what I've seen it do for years, which is great. We outperforming stock and bond portfolio, we're outperforming risk parity, um, right now, we've been outperforming uh, large caps. That's not always the case. We're not. Uh, we're definitely not trying to beat uh, the the S and P five hundred or anything like that. Um, now, are we attempting to get a better risk profile than the S and P five hundred? Absolutely, because consistency definitely wins the race. We don't want to have fifty percent drawdowns like what the S and P has. We don't want to have these 33% drawdowns like what happened in COVID and pandemics and um, even 12% drawdowns or 16% uh, drawdowns that happened in debt crises and flash crashes and those types of things. We want to have consistent where we can just almost draw a line of where our drawdowns stay. So that way we can depend on it. That way we can invest in strong risk profiles. That even goes into say like, okay, well, 
sure, that it's better risk than the, the general stock market and everything like that, just because we're not having these crazy drawdowns and gut wrenching moments. And oh my God, I just lost half my life savings that happened in 2008. What if we go through another dot com? All those types of things, all those what if scenarios. Even in a stock bond portfolio, uh, we drastically improve the risk that happened in a stock bond portfolio. COVID didn't draw down as hard, but you can see here, we can still improve over even what a stock bond portfolio does in something like uh, a dot com, a 2008, long term bear markets, those types of things, because we have the potentiality of other assets providing the return because of their fundamental nature in opposition to uh, growth assets like stocks. If we build portfolio does all this and we've been live and it's been great. Everything's been uh, very well. I'm, I'm really grateful that it's found some, that so many people have found it and found use for it. So there's updates and, and new features that we've added, right? Uh, so originally it was just the portfolio. It was, here's what the allocations are. And we've, uh, with the help of Tom at Aramir, we've been able to make this uh, more simple for people, uh, for, for anyone wanting to use it and a little bit more inclusive to what, what is helpful. So first is a weekly commentary. I write a weekly commentary about uh, just general topics. What's in some things it's what's in the news. Sometimes it's what Powell is talking about. Sometimes it's a macroeconomic environment. Sometimes it's specific assets or um, long-term projections or uh, investor behavior. Um, any, any type of weekly topic is in there. And then on top of that, it has the, what's our, what's our change in risk? Now that's not necessarily what the portfolio is doing, but it's just, what's the change? Are we looking at something that's improving based on the macro environment or is it degrading based on the macro environment? Next is we added a philanthropy. That was something that we wanted to start off with in the very get-go, which we've done. Every month uh, we donate to a charity and uh, we've been able to do more and more donations every month. It's been wonderful. And it's been nice that we can have the impact that uh, of positive things across the world while we're using the service while the service is providing a value to other people. So we're just really uh, attempting to add as much value to the world and to people's investments as possible. What's nice about having more subscribers and more people is that the forums are more active. We've got more people talking about a lower risk mutual fund or lower, uh, lower fees mutual funds, different leveraging strategies, those types of things. So that's always nice little information and tidbits in the forums as well. Then lastly, we added a new online portfolio managing tool. And Tom's been working diligently on this and getting it to where it's really nice and usable online. And I'm just gonna go through a really quick weekly example just to show how fast and simple this is and really kind of prove that it only really takes five minutes and we can just knock this out and move on with our life on a weekly basis. And it's not meant to be uh, a strategy or an investing strategy that takes you know all day or an hour a day or even two or three hours a day or god forbid we're in front of the computer all day and our life is gone because we're staring at a computer screen all day this was meant to give people their life back this is why i use it is so that i can be more productive in other areas of my life i have other trading strategies that i'd rather focus on than just the you know, uh, cash pile that's just investing and doing its job, uh, but I didn't want to take the typical risk of a typical portfolio. And I didn't want the drag of bonds that a risk parity portfolio has. So that's why I designed it. So the weekly management example, <laughs> excuse me. All right, this is kind of the uh, initial look that you'll have on the, the sleep well portfolio model allocation slide. And this, uh, I've changed all of these allocations. So this is not reflective of live or anything like that. These are all totally uh, different, but I just wanted to throw an example up here. And the first thing that we're gonna do, if I wanted to mirror the portfolio and watch what a uh, virtual portfolio would have. 
is we click this button down here, which throws you into the editor page. And this might look a little complicated at first, but we're going to simplify things down. Just instructions down here, just in case we get a little bit lost. Different leveraging portfolios, if I wanted to do 1x, 2x, 3x leveraging. And then what the actual, um, what the actual model portfolio looks like right now. And then with the leveraging, we can change the leverage over here to each individual asset if we even want to choose something different than these leveraging portfolios. We have our net asset value up here, which we're going to kind of dig into a little bit, our allocations, and all of that. So the first thing that we've got to do is we've got to type in what, how much a virtual portfolio we'd want to match, right? You know, so let's say I want to do uh, $20,000 or something like that. Let's just say it's 20 grand. Then our next thing is, is we hit this create button once we add it, once we put in our nav and once we hit create. And that'll throw us into this. Once we hit that button, everything updates. So we've got our prices in here. We've got our allocations. We've got how much cash is on the sidelines and everything like that. Everything's all done and it's all meant to be automatic. But if we want to change some things, maybe the pricing's a little bit different at a broker or we want live pricing in rather than delayed pricing, uh, we can type that in and uh, refresh, refresh shares and refresh our, our cash calculations and all those types of things. Also, we're able to change any allocation if say we wanted uh, to shift it based on some sort of bias, uh, something hopefully data-driven. And uh, it'll actually tell us if that we are um, either under correlated down here or, or sorry, under allocated or over allocated as far as a percentage wise of our capital. That's a really nice feature that Tom got all set up. Once you're all said and done and, and everything's matched up, but basically all you had to do was uh, type in the nav, click create. And then next, our next thing, once it's all populated and we're okay with everything, let's just click this finish button. You can tweak it a little bit too. Like here you see you have $600 of cash. You could pick some combination of the uh, assets you have and add one or two shares here and there and, um, and kind of you know get the cash down as low as you want. Right, right, right. Yeah, maybe say you've got a margin account or something like that and you're okay going a little bit into margin if you wanted to push it right up to zero or something like that. Well, like um, even here, if you have 603, you could add an extra SPY and an extra GLD and then be what five eighty, so you'd have like twenty three dollars of cash left in your account. So you'd be pretty much a hundred percent allocated then. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I and, and that's what I've loved about what you've made about this. And this it's so it's simple and it's clean, and you can change the things that uh, you wanted to change. Um, as far as what I do in the model account and what I do in my portfolio is, uh, I, I basically always leave a little bit of cash buffer just for like variance that happens in the day. Um, sometimes in really, really volatile time periods, such as back when it was like COVID and things like that, assets were moving around pretty fast. Um, so a little bit of cash buffer helped things from going into margin. And then uh, when it's definitely less volatile and things like that, you can uh, uh, neck up that little bit of cash buffer uh, specific, uh, substantially. Oh, and uh, Rick Van Buren. Hi, Rick. He said, uh, doesn't know if you mentioned it, but do you run a parallel leverage portfolio? So um, I, in, in my PAs, I leverage. And now, you know, how anyone does that, it's, that's uh, their risk levels. And what uh, Tom has done is he has taken the leverage portfolios and every week when I allocate and trade the, uh, the 1X portfolio, uh, then what ends up happening is, is I'm putting the prices in that are the live mark that, that are the live market prices of the leverage versions, and it's keeping track of that too. And you can see that on the airmere.com slash sleepwell, which we'll get to that uh, website in just a second. So yeah, um, it it does actually show what the returns of that are. Um, it's just not like this model portfolio that we're going to see um, that we saw on the previous page. So we'll get into questions in here in just a little bit. Let me just knock this out, and uh, we'll get done. Okay. And so once, uh, here, let me go back here. Once we hit the finish button, we'll end up get, getting thrown back into this page, which 
This is basically saying, hey, we're fresh. We have no previous allocations, nothing like that. And if I wanted to match this portfolio, these are the shares that I would have had to uh, change. Well, that's all great and fine and dandy. Well, what about next week, right? You know, this is a, uh, that's the very first time and, you know, I'm going to keep this going and this is a, this is a long-term portfolio. So I've always got to be adapting and slightly moving these allocations around and they will, they will move around. So what do you do? You hit this nifty little button that Tom has, which is the new weekly allocation and it'll throw you back into the allocation editor. But something that we don't see here is that it's got a memory of what the portfolio was. So once we adapt to the new allocations, so <laughs> we've got all these new allocations that are in here and we update our nav up here too, by the way, here, I lost my pen here, excuse me, I was scratching here, but we update our nav as our first thing. So now we're going from 20,000 to 25,000. So woohoo, we had a fantastic week, oh my gosh. And then um, and now our percentages are all different down the board here. And once we're done with that, we can hit the update button or we can hit the create and then we can hit the finish button. And once we do that, it'll throw us right back into that page. But if you notice, it's a little bit different because now we have this previous allocations and previous shares button or uh, section. And that tells us what we were in and how the allocations shifted and what the difference is now in the buy sells to match the portfolio now. And so we're shifting only some, some sections, right? We go from 93 shares to 144, or we go from nine to four. So we're just shifting the allocation from week to week. And that's what's been, and that's it, and you're done, right? Once you've done that, and if, you're, if someone were to be wanting to match it at a broker, you would just make sure that everything matches this sheet and uh, it's all said and done. Um, live, my model accounts um, and in my PAs, anything that's one X leverage, I put in at market price. I don't put limit orders in or anything like that. Nothing complicated. I just execute them with simple market orders. These are extremely liquid ETFs, extremely liquid. They fill with very tight bid ask spreads. That's not the same with the leveraged versions. The leveraged versions, if you're an advanced enough investor that wants to leverage a little bit. Um, I do use limit orders on the leveraged versions um, on some in particular that don't have as much liquidity and there's a little bit of bid ask slippage uh, if they're not extremely liquid, even though a lot of the leveraged versions of these ETFs are still very highly liquid and can handle many billions of dollars. <laughs> so um, with that said, you know, this is a service. And what do you get when you subscribe? You get the weekly allocation updates, which are the model portfolios that I use. You get the model portfolio tracker, which is actually watching what the model, what, what a model portfolio is doing from week to week. What is it up? What is it down? How it's looking? Then you also get the weekly uh, market commentary that I put out every week the portfolio tracking spreadsheet, which is what we just went through. So that way, if, if you wanted, you can do something mirrored or you can tweak or see if you can um, outperform or just some kind of learning uh, mechanism is always a, a, a great attribute. We have a monthly webinar to get questions answered, to talk about uh, different aspects. I go through each asset, just kind of some of the technical overviews. I also go through uh, kind of the macro environment. Where's the inflation going? Are we in deflationary? Are we? Are, are there any canaries in the coal mine showing up? Are there any you know red flags? Are there any? Maybe we need to watch out for this kind of thing. You know. Um, and then we also say, yeah, you know, this is this is a, a a good go time, and there's not much on the horizon right now. So that's always kind of a nice thing on the on the monthly webinars. They last about an hour, and uh, typically I'm I'm blasting through them pretty strongly for an hour. Uh, and subscribers they have access to those old recordings too. Ah, yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, so um, as a subscriber, you can always look at some of the older uh, monthly webinars that I've had, and um, you can kind of see where how things have moved, and uh, really just kind of a uh, 
was 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 this was this right? Did it work? Is 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 things um, acting like it, uh, like the expectations are right? And then uh, private discussion forums. Those are the forums as we have more subscribers and as we have more members that are a part of the community. Uh, it's really great because we talk about different things. Um, sometimes I jump on there when I'm changing a leverage or uh, in something in, in my own personal account or uh, if there's you know a drawdown opportunity that I could take advantage of that if I had some spare cash on the side, I could kind of invest in things like that are some of the recent things that I've posted. And then you definitely get email access to me. You can always throw out a question to me and I'll answer you. Uh, I do typically make it a uh, habit to attempt to get back to you within 24 hours during the work week. Um, on the weekends, I'm not always by a computer. So uh, that one's where it gets a little bit delayed sometimes, although I will still check. And then uh, you get membership in an active investor and trading community, which is Aramir, which are a lot of brilliant people that uh, a lot of engineer types too, that are super advanced. And I just talked about just amazingly intelligent topics. And we talk about volatilities and skews and um, options and futures and just different tweaks with different brokers. And it's just a really, really amazing community that um, all uplift each other and all help each other out. And it's really just an amazing community to be a part of. Now, that when you subscribe with the Sleepwell portfolio, uh, you know, what is it? How much is it? Where, where can you find it? We've made it to where it's a three-tier pricing, one being $50 per month, which is nice and simple for if you want to do monthly basis and keep it going. And then we do a quarterly basis, which you can save a little bit on that. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that have opted for that option. And then there's also a yearly basis for, Hey, I just want to just take this out and get a really nice discount and it's uh, 500 per year. Also, we have a wake up from winter special going on right now, which is basically when you buy one month, you get one free. When you buy a quarter, you get two free. When you buy a year, you get three months free. But what's nice about that is uh, it's, it's, it's always um, nice to get a couple months to push a, a subscription a little bit further and things like that. I call it the wake up from winter because I live up here in the Pacific Northwest and we're just now starting to get some regular <laughs> sunshine and it's starting to feel like we're waking up. Uh, so from that point, um, I've seen that there's been uh, some questions that have been thrown in or some comments and things like that. Um, Tom, let's, uh, let's start knocking them out and uh, wrapping this thing up. Okay, uh, let's see, I see one from Brad. He said, uh, you're showing you update the allocations every week. Can you do it less frequently, say once a month or once a quarter? Great question. And um, yeah, so this is a very, very common question. I, I made the portfolio to where it can be updated on a weekly basis because that was where there was kind of the most comfort, the most adaptability for changing macro environments. Now, with that said, most of the time, they are very small shifts from week to week. And what that does is, um, is it does make it available to where, hey, let me just take what the portfolio is this, this month and do it. And there are subscribers that only update once a month. Um, I, a once a quarter would be a little too slow though. So uh, the, the furthest I've pushed things out and what I've done and definitely what some other subscribers are is if they see some small allocation shifts, they don't really follow them. They'll just like, hey, it's a small allocation shift. We're not having a large macro change or anything like that. And uh, I'll just wait. And so sometimes they can push it uh, you know, a few weeks or something like that and just adjust it once a month. So yeah, that's a great question. Uh, let's see. Um, Peter says a slight, slightly modified original allocation tracking spreadsheet uh, had uh, the ability to generate orders for Thinkorswim. So I guess uh, that spreadsheet's still available. Um, I, I, so the original spreadsheet used an RTD function that pulled in data from Thinkorswim to be able to have like live pricing. I, it never had the ability to, to output any trades into Thinkorswim though. So right now we don't have that functionality. Um, Tom, that would definitely be on your side if that would ever be something in the future. Yeah, As I could probably code that if I get the formats. So, uh, yeah, I'll, 
Uh, I have access to a couple of Thinkorswim accounts, so I can test it. Okay. Yeah. So that would be kind of cool if we could maybe get a, a few broker things and things like that. Um, just, you know, just remember, you know, Aramir or myself are not, you know, suggesting anything, but we can definitely make that functionality. Let's see. Tom asked uh, if one needs a monthly income, say half a percent of your uh, ODPF per month. Now, do you assume just with the draw the funds from the sleep well portfolio or have a separate income portfolio? I guess PF is portfolio. Um, so I guess he's asking if he has a, a monthly draw from the portfolio. Um, like what does it change or something yeah, like that? You say um, half a percent. I mean, it would just reduce your overall yields, but. Right, it will reduce your overall yields. Um, what, definitely, definitely, definitely. It's a significantly different animal when you get a really volatile asset. So like say if someone was just pure indexing and they have a draw on that, drawing on that type of portfolio that really has high volatility can, can really be detrimental. So the less volatility when you're taking a draw on something, the more efficient you're going to be and the less yield drag you're going to have. Um, uh, I mean, of course, talk to a financial advisor about draws and incomes and types of things like that. Um, but the fact that the sleep well portfolio does take less volatility risk, typically by about half of what the S&P does, um, it's easier to draw off of it than, uh, say, an indexing portfolio. And Dan, as for leverage, do you provide the leverage ETFs to use? I can answer that, yes. In fact, I, I even show the current ETF prices for all of the one, two, and three X leverage ETFs that are in use. Yep, yep. And, and we have updated those because um, we used to have, a, I think it was UGL, and then now it's UGLF so for three X leverages and things like that. Um, so yeah, we do provide those so that way uh, you can have reference to them. And Rick asked about, um, do we post the leverage portfolio and suggestions as well as historical performance? Um, I just added a chart to that uh, sleep well page. It shows the comparison of the one, two, and three X uh, leverage versions of the sleep well. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you want to pull it up, Wayne, real quick. Um, I don't have it like really uh, right in front of me or anything like that. So I wouldn't be able to pull it up. I can actually throw the screen back to you if you wanted to jump into that. Uh, you yeah, have it just pull it up real quick. Yep. So here, I'll stop share for a second. All right. We'll move this over here. And here we go. I can share this. Share my screen. That's a great question. And that was one surprising thing that when I originally developed this and we went live with it, it was, um, it was really... Uh, it was really great, like to, just to see um, how many people were uh, leveraging it up and being efficient with capital and and things like that, um, and just using it as a growth engine. Also, now the uh, I'm, I've got this in Excel because I'm still in the process of doing the coding for it. But uh, let me find the spreadsheet I use for this. Do -do -do. Here it is. Let me just pull this over. Okay, so. Um, where, what am I looking at? Is this the right one? Seems like this is the wrong spreadsheet. Yeah, this is a, not the right one. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was uh, one of my intermediate ones. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Hopefully I didn't wipe it out. Well, it's, it's okay. I mean, we don't need to necessarily see the sheet itself, but um, it's, yeah. it's just nice that we have the chart right there and you can kind of see how it's been performing and any time that you leverage up something there is you know there's, there's extra risk in leveraging um, now of course people that are used to options and stuff like that are, are no you know they don't shy away from risk just because most of the time you can get wiped fully out and those types of things so the fact that uh, but you can see here that as volatility in the portfolio uh, happens it does create a little bit more volatility in the leverage versus the unleveraged. And so that's why like taking something like the SPY and leveraging it all the way up eventually blows up because you know you take a 50% drawdown in something that's 3X leveraged and it's gonna um, definitely have some issues. Um, I did just see something that popped up about uh, commissions. Um, most ETF 
or most brokers, um, almost all of them right now are, are free commissions with ETFs. So they're, For they're stocks, stock ETFs. Trading. Yep. Yeah. It's not options. Right. So, so it's, it's not, it's not commission intensive anymore. Right. Um, and for those people who don't want to trade themselves, there's always, uh, we have, um, agreements to, uh, have it traded for you at, uh, registered investment advisor firms. So that's another possibility too. If you know somebody that's maybe not a trader, doesn't want to do it, they can have it done for them. Yeah. And you can just reach out to us, um, on the uh, website at airmere.com or anything like that. And, uh, we'll get you in touch with the registered investment advisors. And Andrew asked, uh, do you use computer models to incorporate inputs such as economic cycles and other fundamental inputs into deciding how to allocate the portfolio or, or are these inputs discretionary? That is a fantastic question. So uh, it, it is not discretionary. I'm using models exactly like you previously described um, to look at where the business cycles are. Are we having growth? Are we having growth in earnings? Where are upsides and downsides, volatilities and quantitative things? So they're all being wrapped in and inevitably simplified into what the end result is, is what the allocations are. So to the end user, it's just a number, right? But in the beginning, there's a, there's a lot of math going on to figure out what's the uh, optimum allocation for this specific environment. And, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not changing anything on a discretionary basis. The model portfolio is exactly as um, the models are dynamically adjusting. I've done it for years and it's very consistent. And um, even uh, in back-tested results and things like that, um, way back in you know, 2008 and stuff like that, um, it, it does behave uh, very similar and it, and it did it just through COVID, just like it said. And uh, see, Brad asked how far back have you tested the model? I think it was 2007. Yeah, 2007. Um, so the, the specific assets, so I... I have, I have done a synthetic testing further back, uh, but it's not, it's not quite fair because the actual ETFs that we use only existed back in 2007. Okay, a couple more questions. I have to run pretty soon, but um, let's see. Um, Tim asked about making the importance of making weekly adjustments. I think you just answered that um, already about you know, maybe using like monthly or quarterly. And then Rick asked, do you use the portfolio visualizer to build your models? Oh, uh, well, on this presentation, I grabbed portfolio visualizer just to show like a static model, but absolutely not. Do I use uh, portfolio visualizer in the models for um, the sleep well portfolio service? And Larry asked, what's the minimum amount required for a full allocation? Or maybe the, what's a better question is what do you recommend as a minimum? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as recommendations, you know, that, that everyone has their different risk tolerances. Um, now, as far as the strategy goes, um, really 25,000 for a 1x variant is, is perfectly doable and it works well. The assets aren't too large to get into incremental problems. For a leveraged portfolio, um, you can actually get a little bit smaller because the leveraged assets are smaller share, uh, share prices. So you can actually get down all the way down to like, you know, probably 2000, 3000, um, something like that to do a leveraged portfolio. It's a little bit easier. And Brad said, I assume we can decide to update only when the percent allocated changes by more than 2%, for example. Yeah, so there, you could do that. Right. There are absolutely, um, and that I believe there's a topic in the forum. If not, there probably will be one very <laughs> soon um, about, uh, you know, how much variance does it take to actually kick off an allocation adjustment? <clears throat> because, yeah, absolutely. There are some weeks that we only shift, you know, a couple percent from one to another. I will always do it in the model portfolio because, like I said, I'm not using discretion in the model portfolio. I will make an announcement sometimes in the forums or I'll post something in the forums when I'm doing something slightly different in my own PA. Uh, but PA I always, is private account, I assume. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, but I always want to make sure that, hey, this is the actual model um, and, I, and I depend on quantitative and data-backed uh, risk measures to make it consistent. And the only times that I really change some things are Maybe I'll, I might up leverage or down leverage based on how many assets we have online or 
if we've had a really hard pullback that's a that's against the macro trend, sometimes I'll leverage up or sometimes I'll put some extra cash in, those types of things. Um, but I won't do that in the actual model portfolio. The model portfolio is always invested and always invested in exactly the proportion that it's supposed to be. And Norman asked about the spreadsheet. Does it require a subscription to Office? Now, the, the thing you were showing is a, a web-based one that I built so that you don't need a spreadsheet for that. Right. The, the original spreadsheet um, that's still on the forums, if someone prefers to have something with Excel, um, is still there, but I don't, um, I don't support it anymore. We have moved to the web-based version that Tom has. And Rick asked, uh, Wayne, uh, this is your recipe and not an allocation smartly combo you built? Correct. Correct. Right. Well, uh, um, you know, uh, I've, there actually, um, I've, I've talked to a few subscribers that have came from allocate smartly and, and they can definitely say that it's, it's significantly different. And yeah, I, I didn't know about allocate smartly until actually after a few months of running the sleep well portfolio live that someone had mentioned it to me. Yeah. It's absolutely not anything like, um, any of those that I know of at least, although I haven't digged into any specific models or anything like that to me it's kind of like your own version of ray dalio's uh, all weather portfolio yeah correct correct i mean there are some like the fact that the all weather portfolio has commodities in it and we we're basically just talking about why commodities are almost worthless with small caps and things like that there there are some tweaks to it and then um, also the all weather portfolio is very much static which is you know, why it's had such an issue um, on this graph that you're even showing right here, uh, just with the risk parity, right? I mean, yeah. you're just you're you're fighting a macro trend against bonds and bonds are just killing it. So, um, yeah, anyways. All right, well, I've got to run. I think we're out of questions. So great presentation. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the questions. Uh, uh, oh, and uh, last one, I guess, Rick said, is the drawdown based on daily or monthly? It's based on weekly. Yeah. And uh, that's an interesting point is sometimes this, you, we did see the weekly drawdown at about 6% one time, but mm -hmm. then by the time the week had finished, it was down four and a quarter. So when you do see it down intra week more than the average, then that's a good time to get in. It's a, at a cheap price. Right. Absolutely. I even posted something on the forum that day and a 6% drawdown uh, typically happens once a year. So it's, it's pretty rare and it's always a good time to kind of, uh, that's a good time to jump in or that's a good time that, um, and I even posted on the forums that I was throwing in some cash, so. And uh, Edward, yes, this is recorded. I'll get this posted later today or to this evening, but I've got to run to a couple of doctor appointments with my wife, so I've got to go, but uh, thanks everyone, really appreciate it. Wayne, great presentation, good uh, questions and uh, if people are interested, take advantage of that special price. It's uh, We did have somebody sign up last night. So thank you and um, I appreciate your confidence. And uh, remember, uh, like I have at the top of the, the information page, this is a, a marathon, not a sprint. So if you do have a month or two of kind of lackluster performance, what you're really looking for is that longer term uh, outlook. Yeah, it's been fantastic, and, and a lot of people have found a lot of use for it. It's just been, it's been really great that uh, I've been able to provide it, and it's, it's actually uh, a lot of people have enjoyed it thus far, and uh, it's been great, and I've, I've really appreciated uh, talking with all of you today, and you, Tom, always, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch you later. All right.